inviting me. Thank you for inviting me and Steve Kelly. I've known for a while now. He um, he's the man that sort of uh, twisted my arm. I was a bit frightened to be honest because I thought that I had to be in Banger tonight, and I was thinking, "Oh no, I'm in Spain. How am I going to get to Banger?" But luckily, Steve said, "Actually, it's online," which actually is a bit of a shame because I did come. Um, I don't know if you remember; some of you may have been um, at the presentation, but I did actually come to Banger um, a few years ago, uh, as Ian said previously, and um, and. I had a great time, like, but unfortunately it was nocturnal because I basically came up, did a talk and I was off back to, to the smoke the same night. So I didn't get a chance to, to look around. And I hope to come back one day and really have a look and you know hang out with you guys and go and do some good birding. So um, with no further ado, I need to try and find my talk. And uh, yeah, there you go, there it is. Can everyone see it? I don't know if you can. Um, I'm assuming that you can. So I'm not hearing any anyone saying otherwise. Yeah, I think you're. That's working fine. Thank you. Good, great, good, good. Okay, so um, yes, tonight I'd like to talk to you about some of my travels around the world um, in urban areas, predominantly looking for birds and meeting some interesting people along the way as well. Um, this image, by the way, um, was taken in London, in Notting Hill, and I was lying on a pavement for maybe 20 minutes, and it's quite interesting, the number of people that walk past, uh, ignoring you as if you're not there. A few people look at you, um, but only one or two actually look up, like this guy in the stripy shirt, so I'm proud of him. He could be a birder one day. I need to try and contact him and, and get him converted. But let's start at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. And let's see if Mike can, can I sit? So I've been birding um, for some time now, as um, has been quoted earlier. Um, I was born in Northwest London. I had an innate, an innate interest in wildlife. Um, it started off actually with invertebrates, um, but I had no one around me who could actually tell me what I was looking at um, or give me any information. So basically I had no mentor. I taught myself and by the age of eight, I had become a veritable walking encyclopedia on birds of Britain and Europe with North Africa and the Middle East predominantly because I found this book when I was seven. And I remember reading this book thinking, wow, there's so many different species of birds in, in, in Europe. And I learned all the birds. I knew all the names, um, Latin names as well. I knew how big they were in inches. I don't do metric, unfortunately. And um, I knew their plumages and it became the bedrock of my knowledge. Um, and it served me ever since really. The, the, the annoying thing is though, that now bird guides, as you probably know, um, start with ducks and I'm still quite old fashioned. I think they should start with grebes and end. Okay, I don't mind ending with buntings, but certainly start with grebes and divers. Anyway, um, a year later, I came across birds of town and suburb by the, the late great Eric Sims, who was a prolific writer, broadcaster for the BBC, particularly during the 50s, 60s, and I think 70s as well. I uh, wrote a whole truckload of books. Um, this particular book, which was a bit old for me at the time, tender age of eight, but I had to read it several times, but it taught me, it was my first manual on urban birding. And it taught me about the, the richness of actually finding a local patch and to explore places that people would not consider exploring for birds. And that stuck with me to this day. I mean, I'm very much a stickler for local patches, even if I'm in some place for just you know a weekend or on holiday for a week or something. I think it's really interesting to to go to a place on a regular basis uh, and as you know, and, and just see how, what you get over the period of time. It's just a fascinating thing to do. But I'll talk more about that, um, or at least I will hopefully show you the virtues of that a bit more a little later. So I'm going to take you around the globe for the next 45 minutes or so. The first place I'd like to take you 
I cannot start any talk about my travels without talking about my 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 ancestral home, as it were, as it feels like anyway. It's Wormwood Scrubs. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's under the A219, which is top, set, top kind of central, slightly left. Um, it's the area of green, which um, stands out actually within that part of London because there's not any other area that big until you get to the west side and go to Hyde Park. Directly south um, is under the word Castle now, um, is the, um, the Wetland Centre, which is here illustrated as a blue blob, but obviously it's a lot different to that. But the Wetland Centre has actually helped me a lot over the years because I've seen some really interesting birds pass over wormwood scrubs on their way, on their way to the London Wetland Centre, um, including things like bittern, would you believe, and, and I've had a, a multitude of waders come over my patch, um, sometimes heading south, but sometimes heading west, ranging from golden plover and black uh, winged, sorry, black tailed godwit through to um, curly wimbrel, even rough. So it just shows you that having an urban patch, regardless of where you are, you can, you know, you never know what, you, well, actually, a patch anywhere, but you never know what you could be seeing from one day to the next. So Wormer Scrubs um, is 181 acres roughly, and it's an area which is surrounded by a very thin um, bit of woodland around the circumference. And it's so thin, you can actually walk through it, I'd say in about 20 seconds. I mean, it's really thin, and plus a young woodland is planted in the, in the early 80s. The eastern side, so number three, and well, brand number three, basically, is mostly, as you can see, um, sports fields. The western side is by far the best ornithologically, especially number seven, which is our area of grassland, and number eight, which is the embankment, which was um, put there by the Channel Tunnel people um, way back in the 80s. And there was a, a battle to stop them building the Channel Tunnel and taking up um, areas of the Roman scrubs, which we've subsequently lost. And this was the, uh, the, the payback, uh, you know, a, a, an embankment to hide the tunnel. Um, we are now suffering from more problems, um, more devastating problems um, from HS2. But um, maybe I'll, if, I, uh, if I can bring myself to talk about it, maybe we can talk about it just after we leave Wormwood Scrubs. Currently at number eight, which is the, uh, the, the embankment area, there's a uh, Darford warbler, which was found two days ago. Darford warblers um, were quite regular, actually, funny enough, during the, the 90s and early 2000s when I was really concentrating on the site. And they even overwintered. So it's really interesting that an urban area, which is surrounded by urbanity and even has the prison of the same name on the, on the southern border, um, can still attract bird life. So when I go there, I lose myself. And one thing that I always say to people when they say to me or ask me, how can I watch birds in an urban area? I mean, I just, I'm used to going out in the countryside and seeing acres and acres of land, you know, how can I kind of tune myself into this? And my simple answer is that whenever you go anywhere, even if you are walking down the street, but certainly if you're in a park like this, is to imagine that you are on the Faroe Isles or the Scilly Isles or in Norfolk or, you know, in North Wales or, you know, Bardsey Island, anywhere. Just imagine you're in that area and start seeing a landscape you're around, that, that's around you. Start seeing that landscape as if you were a bird. Even if that landscape, even if the habitat is tiny, still look at it as if you are a bird and you'd be, you'd be surprised as to what may turn up. I mean, we talked about Dartford War, but I remember about 10 years ago, well, maybe longer actually, I was with the then editor of Birdwatching magazine and we're doing an early morning visit around the scrubs. And I walked past the only bush, the only little clump of bush of gorse in the whole site. And I said, you know, it'd be great if a Dartford Warbler was in there. And he laughed at me. And whilst he was laughing, there was a, a rustle in the leaves and out popped a Dartford Warbler. And he nearly fainted. He said to me, oh my God, that is a lifer for me. It saves me from going to Arne in Dorset. I've actually seen one here. 
So it, it shows you, you have to open your mind to the idea that anything can turn up anywhere at any time. And once you start doing that, you will actually then start seeing birds. That's my feeling. And one of the, the, one of the celebrated birds of Wormwood Scrubs, um, and obviously it doesn't breed here, of course, but it's the ring oozel. Um, the ring oozel is a passive migrant. It passes through mostly in the spring and it has done for the last maybe 15 years. Um, I remember the first time I saw one there, it came after having a premonition. I dreamt the night before that I'd see one. Um, I woke up in the morning disbelieving, but I went to the scrubs anyway. And sure enough, I eventually found um, a male. It flew right past me, landed in front of me and allowed me to see it in its full glory. Um, my favorite bird, and it spawns back to when I got that book, Birds of Britain, Europe, Middle East and North Africa. And I remember seeing the plate with blackbird and ring oozle on it, thinking to myself, who's going to take me to the Cairngorm to see a ring oozle? Who's going to take me to Snowdonia? And I suppose in the end, my favorite bird eventually came to me. So there's a long story, but I thought I'd cut it short for you. My favorite bird without any shadow of a doubt. Favorite in the world, by the way. But this time of year, um, migration is in full swing. And for me, um, I love, especially in spring, I love seeing wheat ears. In fact, wheat ears um, in spring denote the start of spring for me. Forget about swallows and what have you. It's the wheat ear that is the one that really makes me feel that the seasons are changing. And it's really interesting that you can get birds like this and wind chat you know, even yellow wagtails passing through some very urban areas. You know, I've been on football pitches in the middle of, you know, London, and you've seen, I've seen, you know, wheat here, and I've seen and heard chiff chaff and willow warblers. Migration occurs across a broad front, not just at the famous headlands and famous nature reserves. And that's what you have to keep in mind as well as an urban birder. I remember, you know, years ago, um, I would rush, to the center of the city during October, September, October, instead of going off, you know, to some coastal, coastal headland. And my mates will say to me, what are you doing? And I'm saying, well, actually, I'm really interested in what's passing through my local patch. I'm interested in what's passing through generally, because if you're getting stuff on the coast, it must be coming through inland as well. And I think that's been proven, um, not only by myself, but by many, many others. I, I remember from my patch, we, we, over the years, we found three, Richard's pipits, you know, there's been redback shrike. I mean, it's all sorts of birds that have turned up, common rose finch that you would never have, would have expected previously until you open your mind to the idea of, of them occurring. I mean, autolum bunting is another one that turned up in worm scrubs. So it's really, you know, it's a fruitful thing to keep your mind open. That's the most important thing to be positive, keep your mind open, and you will see birds that you'd never expected. One bird that in a way I didn't expect to see in such numbers is the, uh, the rose ring parakeet. Um, it's, I suppose it's common knowledge that I'm not a great fan of parakeets. Um, I just have a thing about birds, green birds with long tails flying around London. But what's interesting is that over the last say 10 years or so, they've really you know, grown in numbers around the worm and scrubs. And in fact, um, there's, there was at one point a roost a nightly roost of up to 5,000 birds in the winter. And what was interesting was that locals were coming to watch these birds gather um, in their pre-roost before flying silently to the main roost. And locals walking their dogs would to stand there in awe. And I thought to myself, well, this is them having some kind of attachment to nature. And if this is a conduit, if this is the way in for them, then so be it, let it be, you know? Um, so they can stay as far as I'm concerned, and they're doing a good job. The parakeets in, in my patch. Um, so I'll talk about the HS2 thing maybe later. I just, it depresses me to even to think about it, to be honest. But let's move on. Um, I'm now talking to you from Spain, as you probably are aware of. Um, I'm in a region called Extremadura uh, that I'm sure some of you may know. And on this map, if you look in the southwest opposite Lisbon, you've got uh, Badajoz. Looks like Badajoz, but it's Badajoz. Um, um, I'm very close to Badajoz in a city called Merida. I think the next, yeah, the next slide shows 
the more detail of the actual region and obviously the regions circled in red. So the region itself borders Portugal in the southwest. Um, it's the south of the uh, region you have Andalusia, and then to the north you have uh, Castile y Leon and a few other regions. But basically Madrid is in the northeast, about three hours away from where I am now, three and a half hours. And to the southwest, you've got Seville. Extremadura is twice the size of Wales um, or the size of Switzerland, or if you're American, it's just under the size of Kentucky. So it's a big place. I mean, to drive from the north to the south will take about three and a half hours. I'm currently actually in Cathras, um, which is north of Merida. It, People often say Caceres, but it's Cathras. Um, I'm here and I'm basically going to Madrid in the morning because I'm coming to London tomorrow for the first time in a, a year. So that's going to be a bit weird. So Madrid, sorry, Merida has been my kind of spot for the last 18 months, even though I've been coming to this region for the last 11 years. I was here before the pandemic uh, hit. I thought I'd bunker down in my apartment which I've been renting in uh, Merida, thinking I'd be there for two weeks. But 18 months later, I'm still here. But it is an incredible place, the region itself. I mean, people um, who live in Spain um, or, or people who visit Extra Madrid in the summer think of it as being this area of arid, dry grass, burnt, you know, blonde landscape, um, which it is in some areas. But it's such a, a different. Um, there's such a different range of habitats from mountains and forests through to farm, farming areas, through to what they term as the haces, which is basically cork uh, woodlands, cork oak woodlands um, that are kind of quite big and scattered. The trees are very sort of sparsely sort of um, placed next, next to each other, so not sort of a tight woodland, but where in some areas they allow their black Iberian pigs to roam um, and their, their pigs and the, the meat from the pigs has been you know it's one of the the best ham in the world um, and there's also rice fields and of course there's conurbations and cities and I as I said um, I spent a long time in Merida. Merida which I'll explain a bit more about later is the the capital city of the region even though to call it a city is a bit silly because there's only about 60,000 people there and there's no cathedral. So it's basically a, a huge village. And in fact, where I am now in Cathras is the, the bigger place with 120,000 people and a um, cathedral. But I think uh, there is a bit of animosity, friendly animosity between the two cities because people in Cathras think, why the hell is Merida the capital? We should be the capital, you know, but anyway. But there's lots of beautiful landscapes on the edge of town and in town as well. Um, this particular area I found when I was uh, in lockdown uh, on my walks and I'd hear quail singing from these grasslands and in the trees, turtle dove and in the spring, western Benelli's warbler and western sub subalpine warbler. And then it's actually quite near to a river. So there's Chetty's warblers and, you know, tree sparrows, house sparrows, Spanish sparrows. Um, quite a lot of stuff. Plus, I've saw, seen Montague's harriers fly over and there's marsh harriers. Just such a wealth of uh, nightingales, such a wealth of birds to be found. So some of the birds I've been watching in the urban areas um, include the ever-present cattle egret, something, a species that, you know, I've only ever seen once in the UK, only because I've not really been sort of hanging out in the UK much over the last few years. I, I understand they've, uh, they've increased phenomenally and now, you know, uh, can be seen in, in a lot of areas, but in uh, in Extra Madura and certainly Merida, they are one of the common birds. Um, blue throats pass through the city as well on migration. In fact, some of them forget a, a large um, population wintering, mostly in the rice fields. Um, and a lot of the rice fields are sort of either near the city or out in the countryside, and mostly the white spot or red spotted, but this particular individual is the blue-throated version, the blue-throated blue race, which um, nests in northern Extra Madura in the mountains of the um, Grados Mountains. And uh, they think, I think, that they may actually split this because it, it actually 
you know, it's very different looking to the main populations of blue throats, which emanate from further north. And I've only ever seen one of these actually migrating through before. I've never actually seen them in the mountains yet. I've still yet to take a visit and actually try and find them in the mountains. But around now, we've got uh, some very familiar visitors coming through, at least familiar to you guys in Wales. Um, this is a lapwing, of course. Um, in Spain, they're called ave fria, cold bird, because they're found predominantly during the winter here in extra Medina. Uh, even though there seems to be quite a good lot of habitat for them to breed, um, breeding in extra Medina is a very rare event. And the first winter visitors actually turn up in July, but by now they're coming in in their droves. And occasionally, especially if you scan through the flocks, I mean, you'll find golden, pl golden plovers with them, um, but occasionally you may be lucky to find a sociable plover. And I've seen sociable plover practically every year hanging out with lapwings. I think there's one or maybe two sociable plovers that we know of that winter in the region. And there's a multitude of reservoirs all over the place. Um, you'd never think it with extra Madura because people think it's a very arid place. But, you know, I love it, especially this time of year when the waders are coming through. I've got a patch at the moment, which is half an hour from the house. And I get there first thing in the morning, just as it's getting light and I park up right by the shore. And what's interesting is a lot of birds, they're quite nervous. So the gulls, the black headed gulls fly immediately as soon as you approach, as do the gadwall. But the, the, the shorebirds, the waders sort of hang out and I can watch, you know, ring plover, little ring plover, Kentish plovers. Um, a couple, of, well, maybe a month ago, I was watching curly sandpiper, had a curly as well, but rough also show up. And on this particular reservoir, which is different to the place I go to, I've just, just been describing, I remember turning up one day and finding 150 rough with black tail godwits. And it was amazing to see this is just part of the flock. And another time I was on a rice field um, earlier on last year, and I discovered a field which was basically just two acres big, you know, muddy with lots of water patches. And there were 402 rough in that small area. It was incredible. They were just like, 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 like ants walking around. It's incredible. Um, so yeah, the rice fields are a great spot to, uh, to find yourself at this time of year because lots of, uh, lots of the waders come and I'm always searching in, in the vain hope of finding something unusual. I haven't yet, but one day, actually um, two weeks ago, um, someone found a peck stand, which is a very rare visitor to Extra Medina, and I went to, to twitch it. Um, but it was great because watching it and then seeing it alongside Ruff, it was quite easy to see how confusable the two species are, i.e. the female, the reeves, and the uh, petrol sandpiper. Um, next month sees the, the arrival of um, cranes from the north, and they are celebrated in Extra Medina. They're, they're called um, ladies in grey because of their elegance. Um, and I love hearing their bugling, even over the middle of the city. It's great to hear them fly from uh, rice field to rice field. And towards the end of their stay, they normally go early March. They are in the, the haces, I'm, I explained that earlier, where they grow um, oak trees and they eat the acorns before heading north back to their breeding grounds. So Merida. Merida is a really nice city, I think. Um, town, huge village. This is the, um, the bridge, the Roman bridge. And this is another one of the spots, if you ever come to Extra Madura, that's one of the spots where, you know, it's often on people's itineraries. And you can stand on this bridge and birds along the river, which is the Gradiana River, which flows all the way to Portugal. And Portugal isn't that far. In fact, it flows all the way into the Atlantic from here, from there, and actually beyond. Um, this bridge is the oldest and longest Roman bridge in existence, um, still in use. It's over 2,000 years old. And it sort of separates the old city from the new city. And you're looking towards a new city there. Uh, basically, um, it's a great hotspot and my local patch is actually, one of my local patches is actually around this bridge and the park that surrounds it. Um, I often bring groups here and this is a bunch of us looking at some of the birds we've seen. This is an amazing spot actually because it's urban but you can walk 20 yards 
and hear and see 30 different species. And I've actually had that happen to me early spring, you know, Chetty's warbler, booted eagle, um, purple, western swan pen, little bittern, golden oriole. I mean, the names, the birds just keep coming, white stork. It's just incredible standing here and, and watching life go by, avian life go by. Um, there's a park that adjoins this bridge to the next bridge, which is called a Lusitania Bridge. And the park itself is fairly manicured, but even so, in this little area of parkland, I've recorded in one year 115 different species. And that was in a year when I went to that park, perhaps maybe 12 or 13 times across the whole year. So it just shows you how rich this place is. And again, you have birds like crested lark, um, spotless uh, starling, um, you have uh, short-toed tree creeper, you've got uh, marsh, har marsh harrier nesting in the, in, in the uh, there's an island just beyond the, the water there. You've got uh, a, a heronry with uh, glossy ibis, cattle egret, purple heron, grey heron, little and great egrets, as well as spoonbill. It's just quite a fabulous place, actually. And uh, walking along past that bridge, you get into a more rougher area. And there, during the summer, there's melodious warbler. There's also penduline tit. Um, there's great reed warbler. And on the water, it's actually quite quiet on the water. Um, don't see too much. I mean, there's normally coots, mallards are the sort of the, the go-to birds, but you also get lots of cormorants and occasionally gadwall. Um, marsh areas, as I said, nest commonly around the whole region, um, but I see them as a as an almost daily urban bird in Merida. And another classic for me is the house martin. There's simply thousands nesting. I remember when I first came to Merida, or one of the first times, which was back in 2010, 2011, noting on a building, just two sides of a building, about 400 nests of house martin. And I know that the London Wildlife Trust did a survey on house martins, perhaps, I think about eight years ago now, and they discovered 200 nests in the whole of London. So on just two sides of one building, there were more nests than the whole of London. It was just incredible. And they start nesting quite early. I mean, a few years ago, there was a pair that, or several pairs that started nesting in December. They are, even though they're summer visitors, you can actually see them throughout the year. Um, I'm not sure where or where they come from or if, they, or if they are, you know, local birds or if they've come from further north and wintering there. It's, it's hard to tell. Another common urban bird in Merida is a serin, your smallest finch, um, but it's tinkly cool, um, very easy to see, and the, the males are beautiful. And um, of the swifts, there's several species. You've got common swift as well as pallid swift and alpine swift, and all three nest under the Roman bridge. And it's great to be there, especially early in the morning when you've got, you've got the right light conditions and you can photograph these birds flying really close by, making their twittering calls. Um, in terms of uh, waders, well, there's no river or wetland area without black wing stilts. They seem to be all over the place. Gorgeous looking birds. Um, night herons also are to be found and they nest in that heronry that I mentioned earlier. Um, they're found throughout. And the, uh, the, the jewel in the crown, I suppose, is this guy, the Western Swamp Hen, which is like a moorhen on steroids. Um, I remember when I first kind of, you know, came to Extra Majuda and I'd never really seen one before standing on a bridge trying to find them because they are, they're not shy, but they kind of walk in and out of cover with equal ease. So you might, you know, see them right in the open, feeding away, not really bothering, you know, with us. And then it will just walk into the shade and that's it, you don't see it again. They are massive. And I remember looking and saying, oh, that's, that's one, that's one. And I'd be pointing at more hands. And all of a sudden this giant will come out with massive feet and big beak and you suddenly realize, oh, actually, no, that's the Western Swamp Pen. Uh, incredible, impressive bird. And as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of glossy ibis. Over the years, they've actually increased in number. They, they're eating that American um, crayfish. Um, we also have a problem here with 
of that, uh, that alien species. So they seem to be thriving on those crayfish. And now we have literally hundreds, whereas maybe 11 years ago, they were quite scarce in the city. Um, I also mentioned earlier um, the Chetty's warbler. There's everywhere you go that has any kind of any kind of water anywhere, you'll be hearing Chetty's warbler singing. And plus, they seem to be quite easy to be seen as well. And during the summer, we have this majestic bird, the black kite. There's quite a large number that come um, to Spain in the summer. Um, and they are often to be seen along the motorways feeding on roadkill. Um, so they just drift along the motorways. And then come mid-August, bam, they're gone. They just all head south um, to Africa, picked up by my mates team, Glorious Bustards uh, on Tarifa, or flying over Tarifa, but they just all go. I mean, there's one or two that actually winter, but, or you see one or two during the winter, but they just go. And then there's a period of about a month where you don't see any kite at all until mid-September, around about mid-September, late September, the red kites start coming. And there's a winter population of red kites, um, which is nowhere as, as uh, numerous as black kites. And they tend to be birds from Germany and Scandinavia. What's interesting is the breeding population of red kites in extra Madura is fairly low, it's about 150 birds, not many. So yeah, they're replaced by the red kites. But I love um, going to uh, the river near to Merida and there's a roost of black kites and I've counted up to 500 birds coming into roost every night and it's really quite a sight to see them all flying around. Um, look up any day when the sun is shining and sometimes when it's not shining and you'll be seeing griffin vultures um, flying over the city, flying over most of the landscape in extra Majuna. There's roughly about 4,000 pairs nesting, most of them nesting in Montfragui, uh, up in the north. And Montfragui is a place that you may have heard of. It's a very famous spot. If you ever go to extra Majuna, it's a place that you go to see these birds. Um, but anyway, they could be seen anywhere and incredible to watch drifting majestically over along with their cousins, the black vulture. Um, the population in extra, extra Madura is around about 900 pairs of black vulture, which is incredible. And I see them, I mean, today even I saw, I was standing on my uh, terrace and I saw what, maybe five or six black vultures and five or six griffin vultures too. So they're very easy to see. Um, Europe's largest um, raptor, the monk vulture or cenarius vulture as it's also known, has a discontinuous range from Iberia through to Mongolia, but the population in extra Madura is the largest in the world. So they're doing very well. Um, other birds that you're likely to see in town are the uh, Iberian magpies. Interestingly, in Merida, they're not so common in town. In fact, only in the last year I've noticed more coming in. Whereas in the city I'm in now, Cathras, you can go to any local park and they're like magpies, you know, well, they are magpies, but like, you know, common magpies, you see them in good number. They're very cheeky birds, um, not very approachable, but in Cathras, where I'm, I am now, you can get quite close to them but elsewhere they tend to be flying around in, in groups and they don't really allow close approach. Um, the summer cannot be a summer without speed eaters. And I remember being in lockdown and hearing one day, hearing the calls of bee eaters outside my window whilst I was in my office working. And they nest um, in some of the sort of um, derelict areas because there were some areas that were dug up for foundations of housing. And obviously the credit crunch, crunch came and they stopped development and they've been idle ever since. So they're nesting a lot of those areas, digging out the, the loose soil uh, to make their tunnels for their nests. Corn buntings are also very common in the region and certainly around the outskirts of extra Madura, particularly during the winter, they may even venture into my patch near the Roman bridge. Um, very, very common, even though they have shown signs of decline over the last few years. And finally, a bird that comes during the winter to Merida is the black redstart. Um, it breeds in a lot of the mountain villages further north, but during the winter, um, I get them even on my rooftop and they're, they're 
fantastic as you know fantastic birds it's really sad but they're pretty rare in the uk um especially as a breeding bird but during the winter you can see quite a lot of them here in my hometown so i'm going to move from spain to eastern or to the east of the world anyway to uh quite a controversial place these days it seems taiwan and in particular taipei because i've been there a couple of times and taiwan is an interesting place because i actually i would love what I, I remember when i first vis visited taiwan i thought i would actually like to retire here you know because the people are really nice the birding is great because you've got the you've got the kind of the mix between european birds and asian birds but the European birds they have there are actually kind of different races to our birds. So they seem like new species in a way. Plus you've got a whole host of birds which are complete rarities over here in Britain, but can be seen quite commonly there. Um, in Taipei, um, you are serenaded in the parks by maroon orioles, um, stunning looking birds. Sounds kind of similar or the same, same kind. It's obviously an oriole, we can, you know, you can tell by the song but it sounds like a golden oriole, but a, a strange one. But it's a very, as you can see, very stunning bird. And this is a crested tit. The crested tits here have massive crests. I was quite surprised. But then I didn't realize um, that in Britain, and in fact in Europe, there are indeed two species of tit with crests. Of course, one is the crested tit, but the other actually is a cold tit. And I'm sure the ringers amongst us would have noticed that they've got a slight kind of whiff at the back of their head, a little, little tiny, like I think two, three feathers that make a sort of sim a small crest. But over in the east, they are pretty, pretty obvious. Um, <coughs> excuse me, what I really enjoy anywhere in the world is being out and seeing ordinary people interact with nature. This woman was ha had her back to this interpretation board. We're in a in a, in a sort of a botanical garden near Taipei. And she turned round and just before she turned around, this nutcracker had landed on this uh, interpretation board and she, she jumped, she was you know, shocked to see this bird. But then she took her phone out and took a picture and I thought, amazing, she probably doesn't know what that bird is, but it doesn't matter. She's made contact. She's realized that there's some nature around her and, this was enough to make her want to take a picture. So it's really, for me, one of my moments being in um, Taipei and being in Taiwan. Didn't expect it either, actually. This bird, the white whiskered laughing thrush, is quite interesting because um, here in, or there in Taiwan, they call it the iPhone bird. And the reason for that is the fact that you don't need a massive camera to take a picture. You can just go up to it with your iPhone and quite easily take a picture because, <coughs> excuse me, they are very, you know, they're not really that bothered with humans. Um, one of the things about Taiwan is that there's a lot of guys, and I say guys, not many women, but mostly men going around with cameras, with massive lenses, taking pictures of birds. And it's a bit of a sport for them there. It's more about who can take the best picture as opposed to looking for birds in particular. So they're not necessarily knowledgeable birders, they're more about taking pictures. But there are two birds that they seek out all the time um, to take photos of. One of them is this stunning beast. This is a swinhose pheasant. And there's a spot not too far from ta Taipei near a main road where they habitually come out to pick up gr um, grit. And to see this bird is just incredible. I remember when I first saw one on my first visit, it was a very misty, rainy day. And we waited for about two, three hours, and then it came. And despite the dim, dull light, the white on its back, its mantle, and on its tail kicked out like a badger. It was just really bright. And then to see it during you know, good light, it's just fantastic. Look at it, it's an amazing looking bird. But also as incredible is the Mikado pheasant, which I saw for the first time the last time I went to Taiwan. And again, this bird comes out to the same spot to pick up grit. Um, and the males, as you can see, are stunning. The blue is like velvet. You know, you feel like you can just stroke it. It's just so beautiful. The females, despite being brown, 
are still really handsome birds, but the males are incredible. And once, whilst actually watching this, these two pheasants, um, I also managed to pick up the Taiwan partridge, which apparently is quite tough to see. There was a few of them, there was a covey of them, maybe six or seven, in the undergrowth behind the main road. And luckily we saw them, so that was good. Now, I always talk about looking up, but sometimes you have to look down and looking down can make you often look up at the same time. So this is exactly what I did. I was looking down, saw that, looked up, and I saw a Malaysian night heron on a nest, which was great, of course. Malaysian night herons are found throughout Southeastern Asia, but in Taipei, it's one of the best places in the world to see them. They're in the parks, walking around, and the parks have no undergrowth at all and they're walking by a river's edge or lake's edge even and if you approach too closely they will stand up and erect their necks and open their wings as if they're in reeds but there's no vegetation behind them it's quite funny but they're very easy to see and very distinctive bird okay i'm gonna finally end with a place that some of you may already know about because i talk about it incessantly and please excuse me if you've heard the story before but i'm going to tell it again anyway and that's my serbia experience um <coughs> excuse me serbia as you know is in southeastern europe surrounded by hungary romania bulgaria and the first time i went to serbia which was about 13 years ago i was invited to uh, to come and explore you know with the, by the tourism board but to come on a on a press trip as they call it to, to see the sort of wildlife that's available. And I was seeing lots of stuff that um, you'd see in the neighboring countries like, you know, hoopoos and rollers and bee eaters and stuff like that. And my guide noticed that I had a hankering to be in an urban area. So he took me to the very border, the northern border of um, um, Serbia, where it hits with Hungary. And we went to a small park and there were people walking dogs, you know, lovers holding hands, all that sort of stuff. But it was a very wooded park. And we took me to a tree and we looked up and, and there standing on a branch uh, was a long head owl. And I was thinking, wow, that's amazing. But then my, my um, well, he was my guide. He's now one of my great friends. It's my Serbian brother, Milan. He's also the uh, president of the uh, Serbian BirdLife International. He then called the owl because he's brilliant at making the owl sounds and it looked down at us. And then I looked around and I noticed that there were at least 22 pairs nesting, this is early spring, nesting in either wicker, wicker baskets or in full on nest boxes in a rookery with rooks, obviously, but then with 35 pairs of um, common kestrel, which I've never seen so many casuals nesting together and a bunch of uh, red footed falcons, maybe 10 or 12 pairs of red footed falcon. It was amazing. And I was in complete shock. And I was asking how come there are so many owls? I mean, in my life prior to that day, I'd barely seen long-eared owls and I've never seen them nesting. And um, the answer I got was that the farming methods in Serbia are very worse, very similar to what Britain could have been or should have been or was 200 years ago. So they don't harvest all the crop. So there's grain spilt everywhere. The barns have no walls. So therefore there's lots of grain around there too. So it's a rodent's paradise. So during the winter, um, or even during the spring, even during the summer, all year round, the birds are, should I say, the, ro the rodents are fed upon during the day by kestrels and by night by the owls. So I garnered a few bits of information and I came back that following winter and I brought a bunch of people with me who had never seen an owl before in real life. And it's quite surprising the amount of people that actually haven't seen owls before in real life. Um, so we came back and I remember we, we went um, to Belgrade, we landed in the evening, we went up to the hotel up, up in the north and it was dark and at night we went for a walk after dinner 
And of course, someone spotted an owl. Oh, look, there's an owl. And they were freaking out. It's amazing, you know. And I was thinking, you haven't seen anything yet. And over the next day or two, we journeyed around a couple of the local towns. And there were long-eared owls literally in the streets, roosting in trees. And for every one or two you saw, there were another one or two you didn't see. And whenever they were approached too closely, either by locals walking past or whatever, they would all sort of scatter out of the tree and then you realize, wow, there was actually far more than I expected. And they all looked so different. I mean, I can look at these owls. I mean, I've been back every year, apart from last year, of course. Um, I've been back every year and I just can't get over them. I think it's just incredible how different they all look and just incredible the fact that they are here in such large numbers. My um, friend Milan, um, 12 years ago, his whole thing was to protect them, as it is now, obviously. So he did a, a, a census of northern Serbia and he found that there, there must be at least 25,000 individuals wintering in the region. But one particular town was incredible. This town is called Kikinda, which you may have heard of now, but back then, you know, who'd heard of Kikinda? It's just a, an average town in you know that part of Serbia but in their town square <coughs> there was a, a massive roost of owls and by the way these owls didn't sort of mind landing on man-made objects as well I've never seen a, a long an owl on, on, a, on, a, on a, a washing line before I don't know if you have but anyway um, in the town square there's a collection of owls that roost there and it ranges um, when I start sort of turning up in de December mid-December and the numbers can reach, uh, I think the record count was 800. And if you can imagine this town square is an average town square with shops, churches, and not that wooded. I mean, there's a few sort of spruces and junipers, but that's about it. But they all congregate there. And it's just incredible to look up and see that amount of owls in the trees. Um, and when you see how they actually um, behave, it's quite interesting because they just prior to dawn, sorry, not dawn, uh, to dusk, they will fly up from their roosts, from their perches. And this is when it's just getting dark and fly to another branch or to fly on top of a church or something, almost as if they're, they're exercising before then flying off into the countryside to hunt the, uh, the rodents. But what's interesting is that short-eared owls have also taken to roosting with them, not in great numbers, more ones and twos here and there. And they have a very different behavior in that they, when they leave, they fly up in the sky in a, in a, in a lasso type fashion. So they kind of in ever, ever increasing circles and then kind of drift off into the countryside um, to hunt. And also when you flush, or if you flush them during the day, instead of like the long-eared owls, they just explode out of the tree and then they generally come back to the tree um, eventually, the, the short-eared owl will fly clean away, just fly away. And you can also notice that they're bigger birds as well. So it's really fascinating to see that number of owls. And I, I believe that even barn owls have taken to roosting with them as well. So it's just an incredible phenomenon, but the main, the main part of this story is the fact that you don't have to be in the middle of nowhere to see amazing things. You can also be in the middle of somewhere, right under our noses. 12 years ago and beyond that, um, these owls were deemed as birds of doom and locals were actually actively killing them. And I remember when I turned up 12 years ago, locals were looking at me and I was there with my jaw dragging, dragging on the ground. And they were saying, well, what's, what's the problem? 12 years on, it's a very different story. They've realized through ecotourism and through the fact that they're getting money from these owls, that to protect them is actually far better than killing them. And, you know, they've taken them to their hearts. They've, um, there's stores selling owl paraphernalia. And there's also, you know, the same t-shirts and mugs. But they also, in Serbia, owls are called Sova. So they've renamed November, Sovember. And the schools, all do lots of owl orientated activities and kids dress up as owls. But the best thing of all is the government has made this town square in this innocuous town in Northern Serbia, a nature reserve. 
the first of its kind in the world. And that is incredible. Anyone, ca anyone caught disturbing these birds, particularly over Christmas, New Year, could be fined up to 10,000 euros. That's brilliant. And that's the sort of thing that should be happening all over the world, not just in one spot. Urban areas can be very, very important for the safeguarding of species. I mean, these birds actually are here or there uh, as, a, as an a happy accident because the countryside outside of the city um, or outside of the towns have been, all the trees have been cut down to make way for farmland. So they had no choice but to come into the urban areas. And of course, in the urban areas, you've got the uh, island heat effect. So you've got the um, island, city island heat effect, should I say, which means that, you know, the, 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 the area within the built up the landscape within the built up area is actually five or six, maybe even seven degrees warmer than it would be outside. And also they are less likely to be hunted. So it was a win, a total happy accident for the, for the owls. Okay, I want to quickly end our talk or my talk by saying that I've recently set up the Urban Bird of World membership community. And the aim is to unite people around the world um, to get them all, to get all the people that are interested in, in urban birds together and in, you know, to talk to each other, but also to take advantage of discounts on products and services, as well as getting involved in early, in, a, in online courses, but also to um, have free guides to cities and bird guides and stuff like that. There's lots of stuff that can be gained from being a member. And my long-term goal is to set up a foundation in which um, I, I'm, we'll be able to give money to projects within urban areas to get kids connected to nature right on their doorsteps. So that's my long-term goal with this membership community. And I'd, I'd love you to, to take part if you could. Um, I'm offering a discount because normally the silver membership is 50 pounds, but I'm doing it for 20 pounds for the year, provided you do it before the end of October to become a member. And if you do, all you need to do is to, uh, punching the code TUBW hyphen 20 hyphen silver, all in capitals, apart from the 20, which are numerals. But that's my little plug for tonight. Um, I'd like to thank you all for, <coughs> excuse me, um, allowing me to come and talk to you tonight. It's been a great pleasure and I'm really looking forward to the time when we'll be able to meet face to face and when it's awful situation the world's got itself into improves and we can move around more freely i look forward to that day thank you very much and if you have any questions please